thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, we've been doing our citizen science lectures for six years, almost every month. So keep your eyes open and go to the library website. And you can also leave us your email address and we'll let you know what's happening next. And you can tell us what you would like to have happen. Uh, my name is Patrice Keat, and I am uh, the founder and former director of the Santa Cruz Children's Museum of Discovery in the Capitol Mall. Go visit if you haven't. And Brenda and I put this series together from the public library uh, that long ago, and we're really excited when people come out and participate. Um, tonight we have um, Barry Bowman uh, from UCSC, professor of molecular and cellular, cellular biology. And he will tell you all about himself. Thank you. Okay, so recently retired from UCSC, three years at this point, but I've been here for 40 years, 40 plus years. Um, and um, so I, I grew up in Wisconsin and for number of years lived on a little dairy farm outside Madison, Wisconsin, and, and that got me interested in the natural world and, and in agriculture. Uh, my, my college training, including through, uh, through graduate school, was in plant biology. I haven't, in the end, actually worked with plants myself. I, I, I work with fungi. I'm basically a, a cell biologist. I'm interested in what is the internal structure of cells. And of course, they're similar, so similar in all sorts of organisms. But I use very much the same methodology, the genetic techniques that people who are working with plants use. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, so I picked this, this topic because it's something that we hear a lot about, and yet, you know, generally what we, what, what we really know about it is pretty superficial. And so my goal is to tell you what a GMO plant is and how they're generated and kind of how and why they're used through, throughout the world. So GMOs are somewhat controversial. And so if you, for example, uh, just look at some polling data, uh, if you ask sort of all US adults, this is a little, this is five years ago, whether they feel that a GMO plants are, are basically unsafe or generally safe, about 60% feel that they're unsafe and about 40% feel that they're safe. But interestingly, if you ask science people, so this is just asking at the American Association of Scientists, you find that 9 out of 10 scientists think that they're safe. I'm a scientist. I do fall into this group. Uh, but I'm going to try and give you an objective overview of, of, of the, the arguments here. Did, well, I was just wondering if you could just define what you mean by genetically modified foods. Yeah, that's going to be much, oh, kind be of the whole top. talk. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, the whole talk. All right, so let's go to that. Exactly. Because the word itself, of course, is its rather generic use of the words. Because almost everything that we use agriculturally is genetically modified in that it, it's hard to think of anything, in fact, that is something we eat that is actually the same as it grows in the wild. But the only thing I can think of is something like Brazil nuts. They still get those from wild trees. But, but you know, about 85% of all our caloric intake basically comes from three crops, corn, wheat, rice. You know, and then, of course, everything else has been evolved over the last 10,000 years. So. Traditional plant breeding has come, come to bring about all, all of our fruits and vegetables. And of course we know that the basic way that this happens is uh, over the years farmers have been looking for, for some apple tree that makes a particular, well apples are a terrible example, they don't work, <laughs> it's the worst example. Uh, but let, let's say growing corn, you know, growing corn, uh, find a corn plant that makes a nice big ear of corn, you keep that one and you plant the seed, and some of the progeny will also have big ears of corn, and you keep those and you plant them and you select for resistance to disease and to drought, etc. And so by these traditional 
breeding methods, you can select something that has the combination of genes that are best for an agricultural crop. All right. However, really going back almost 100 years, we've been using crops that have induced mutations. Now, I don't think this is so generally un appreciated. So if you wanted to get some corn that was a little bit bigger, all right, one way to do it is to grow a huge field of corn and try and find those one or two odd plants that have some naturally occurring mutation that affects the size of the fruit. All right. And then you grow that and you cross it and you try to you know, get it to grow in the progeny. But of course that's very slow and very inefficient. So going back nearly 100 years, what they were looking for is to some way to modify the genes such that mutations occurred more frequently. And that is to damage the DNA on purpose to get mutants. And so they did it with irradiation works, ultraviolet light will work, there are many uh, chemicals that will work, and so over 3,500 of our crops that we use today were derived from mutations that were reduced, generated in this sort of kind of <coughs> chemical way. All right. Once you've got the mutant gene that makes the, the corn cob bigger, all right, then that gene, which is just some little change in the sequence of A's, C's, G's, and T's in the DNA, once you've got that, you can propagate that gene, all right, and have a more productive crop. So, in fact, almost everything we eat is genetically modified and really doesn't come just out of traditional breeding, but out of this, this kind of use of uh, mutagens. Uh, oh, what about, excuse me, what about heirloom? What about what? Heirloom, you know, tomatoes, or are, are they modified? Depends on how old they are, is the answer. So I mean, naturally, yes, when you choose the best one, and so on, and so on. Yeah. I mean, when it's artificially done. But, but the fact that there are so many of them, uh, so, so it would depend, you know, if it's, if it's 50 years old, it, it, you know, if it goes, you know, that's actually not a very old tomato. Probably a lot of things that we call heirloom crops probably are derived from traditional plant breeding. Probably. Yeah. All right. So then, starting uh, somewhere around in the mid 90s, we started really having the application of, of more advanced laboratory techniques to changing the genes of plants. <coughs> or doing something quite different, actually taking genes from other organisms and exerting and inserting them into plants for, for like drought resistance, or I'm going to talk to you about the major ways this is being done in the crops we're using today. So this is sometimes called recombinant genetic engineering, and that is the type of modification that we refer to when we talk about a GMO plant. So GMO plant is one in which the DNA of that plant has been changed by a laboratory procedure in which you actually put in some different gene or by a laboratory procedure kind of removed or moved around some gene within the plant. It's the technique that, that varies. All right. Now, this kind of technology is being replaced by kind of newer technology today within the last five years. And the main uh, procedure is called CRISPR. How many of you have heard of CRISPR? <laughs> what a well-informed audience. All right. <laughs> if you haven't, you should. All right. Because CRISPR is a very powerful technique that allows biologists to change genes much more easily than it was ever done before and it's being applied to basically all biological organisms. It turns out to be amazingly easy, pretty cheap, uh, <coughs> scary. <laughs> all right, and that's another talk. It might be good to get, there, there, you know, lots of people are using it in the lab on fruit flies and 
fungi like I do, and there, there are quite a few people up at UCSC who are using CRISPR technology. It might be good to get somebody who uses that to tell you, tell you about CRISPR. Uh, I'm going I'm to, at the end, just tell you a little bit about it in plants, but the bottom line is CRISPR in, in many ways is a much cleaner technology. You, 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 uh, you make very few changes in the DNA, just kind of the changes that you want in the DNA and not any auxiliary side products. And so it, it's being rapidly adapted. It also just, just really works. I'll come to that just a little bit at the end. All right, so let's look at the kind of current state of genetically engineered crops, GMO crops, in the United States. And the main point of this slide is that this technology was started to be used in the mid-90s. If you look at to what extent it's been adopted by farmers, it has almost completely taken over American agriculture. So something like soybeans, here HT means herbicide tolerant. And this is basically uh, resistant to the herbicide Roundup that you've heard about. So now almost 95% uh, 90, of all the soybeans grown in the United States and in many other parts of the world are GMO soybeans. Corn, corn, and now there, there are two types of corn here. Some is herbicide tolerant corn, and I'm going to tell you what these are. Or BT, it means that's a, 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 an, an, a, an insecticide that the plant produces, such that if the, plant, the insect eats the plant, specifically caterpillars, it, the plant kills them. And so that's now about 80% of the, of the corn crop. And the other big ones, so besides corn and soybeans, <coughs> cotton is also widely used. And this has become so well uh, adopted because cotton was just becoming so difficult to grow without really using a lot of toxic material on it because of the bull weevils and it's just susceptible to all kinds of insect damage. So uh, GMO cotton has just kind of taken over around the world. So. This is an interesting look at uh, where GMO crops really are grown in abundance. So it's a very bipolar world, interestingly. So in most of the Americas, there is a widespread use of GMO crops. In most of Europe, Africa, Russia, uh, in many places, GMO crops are banned. They do not allow the growth of GMO crops. And that allows for some very interesting comparisons. All right. uh, and then in much of the East and in Australia, there are lots of GMO crops. And so it shows the major ones here, corn, soybeans, cotton, canola, which is rapeseed, they make uh, vegetable oil from that, sugar beets, etc. And these are kind of smaller uses. All right. But the point is that worldwide, probably, uh, it's probably fair to say that most of the calories consumed in the world today are from a GMO crop. Now, let's look at kind of what are the major ones that they're using. So, I'm going to tell you about kind of four stories here. One is this Bt toxin, which is an insecticide. Secondly, the Roundup Ready crops, this is a herbicide. It's being used for plant diseases, so certain viruses that are just wiping out certain kinds of crops. Good example is the Hawaiian papaya agriculture. And then lastly, the, the idea that you can make a plant more nutritious, a uh, good example here is the golden rice story. So <clears throat> let me start by saying, how do you make a GMO plant? So let's uh, just, just, so for here, for example, and the first one I'm going to tell you about is there is a gene that encodes a protein that is toxic to caterpillars, all right? And in fact, this material is the major insecticide, the major pesticide that organic farmers use. All right, so if you wanted Put 
this gene into the green leafy parts of your plant. This is how it's been done. So first of all, down the road you know you somehow, how do you get DNA from a test tube into the plant? There are multiple ways of doing it, but one of the most common ones is just to exploit the way it happens in nature all the time. So virtually all creatures, I don't know, I don't know if there are any exceptions from bacteria to us, are invaded by bacteria and by viruses. And in both cases, they can clump onto our cells, inject their DNA into our cells, and in some cases they kill the cell, in some cases they just use the cell. But there is this naturally evolved system among the bacteria and the viruses by which they can insert DNA into cells. So for example, now that we've sequenced all of the human genome, we now know that about, you know, we have this huge genome. We know that about 15% of all our, our DNA is old viruses just old junk viruses that we are carrying around, 15% of all of our DNA. Thousands and thousands of copies of old viruses that we've got. All right, so what the, what the plant biologists did here is they started out with this bacterium, which is a natural pathogen of plant, agrobacterium. And it has in it a little circular piece of DNA. So they could break open the cells and isolate this circular piece of DNA like a little chromosome, self-replicating piece of DNA, and you get it in a test tube. Now, then they could also get from another bacteria that produces this toxic protein, the gene that encodes that protein. And the way you, you do this is really pretty simple. I mean, you break open the cells and, and you use kind of different kind of uh, how do I describe it? You exploit the size and the electrical charge on the molecules to separate all the molecules and you can fish out the genes. All right. So you have in the test tube your little circular DNA from your bacteria. You've got your toxic DNA. You put them together. You mix them up. You put in some enzymes. And you cut open this circle and then you put in your gene into that cut and then you seal the cut again. And how you cut and seal and all that, you use enzymes, proteins, that the cells make to normally cut and repair DNA. You can exploit them as the little tools in your own hand. So now you have a recombinant piece of DNA. You have combined this bacterial piece with this toxin from another bacterium. You've made a new combination of DNA. The reason you want this this uh, other carrier piece is that it has all the information to replicate the DNA and to get the genes turned on. So now you put it back into the bacterium, all right? And then you take these bacterium and you basically kind of soak them with little bits of your plant material. The bacterium will stick to the surface of the plant, it'll break through the wall of the plant, insert that little circle in here, and that circle is now a little piece of random DNA floating around in the cell. And most of the time, the cells will just see it as some junk piece of DNA and they'll chew it up. But at a rate of like one in 10,000, they will say, aha, that's a piece of my DNA. I must have some broken DNA. I'm going to repair it. And they'll splice it into their own DNA. So this happens at a low rate, but if you have a technique to select that one in a 10,000, and there, there are simple methods by which you can do that, then you have taken this toxin gene, and it is now in the DNA, in the nucleus of the plant. And often uh, you can do this just by kind of cutting up pieces of plant tissue and, and infecting them, and then if you spread them out on a Petri dish, They'll, the cells will divide and they'll actually grow on the petri dish just as a little mound of cells often looks like little bits of cauliflower, <coughs> best way to describe it. But you can then take those and put in some, some of the naturally occurring plant hormones and that will induce some of the cells to start forming roots and then the ones on top will start forming shoots 
and it'll generate the whole plant. In fact, one thing that cells can do that animals can't do, we can't do, you know, if we take a piece of your finger, I can't generate all of you from a piece of your finger, all right? But from plants, you can take almost any cell from the root, from the flower, from the petal, and it will regenerate the entire plant. You kind of know that it'll do this in part because you can make cuttings, you can use the little pieces of plants and regenerate the whole plant. So this is not the CRISPR technique. So this is not CRISPR, this is kind of old school now. Okay. Yeah, right. But it is the technique that's been used for almost everything that's in the field right now. I don't know that there are any, I, know there, I don't think there's any CRISPR things that are being used commercially because it's just too new. But I also know that they are, there are a thousand labs around the world that are making them as we speak. All right, so now you've got your plant that is this uh, recombinant DNA in it. So, the first example I'm using is this Bt toxin. So, this, I said, is in fact the major pesticide that organic farmers use. The reason is because uh, the bacterium is considered a, a relatively a less harmful bacterium. It's a naturally produced toxin. What it does is it makes this protein that can insert itself into a biological membrane. <coughs> so this is diagramming the membrane that surrounds all of the cells, all kinds of cells, but including the cells in an in insect larva. And this protein makes a hole in the membrane. <coughs> and what happens is the good things leak out and the bad things leak in. The main thing it affects is the salt balance in, in all of these cells. Any healthy cell has to be loaded with potassium inside, and if it's an animal, it often has lots of sodium outside. It's the basis of your nerve system, how all of your locomotion, etc. If that's disrupted, it kills the cell very promptly. So uh, you go down to the garden center. Uh, this stuff is sold uh, by a variety of brands, but this is the Safer Caterpillar Killer. And if you look on the back to see what it is, Safer Caterpillar Killer, the active ingredient is Bacillus thuringiensis. So it's really kind of a spores of the bacterium and often uh, a fair amount of partly purified toxin protein itself. And so, uh, you know, it says Safer Caterpillar killer is a natural choice for controlling leaf-eating caterpillars. And one interesting thing about this is it's very specific for the larval stage, for the caterpillars. It actually doesn't kill the insects, um, the mature ones. And so it says here, caterpillar killer does not harm honeybees, beneficial anthropods, spiders and mites and things, does not harm earthworms. So it's a fairly selective larval insect larval toxin. So this, is, this has been put into corn, to cotton, to, to wheat, etc., and soybeans, and as I showed you in that first graph, it's probably like 80 to 90 percent of the plants grown in much of the world, in all of the Americas, etc. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's been very, very uh, effective. So the, why, why do the farmers buy it? Because it ups the yield, and it, it means they, they don't have to spray with insecticides. They often don't have a choice. Uh, there, there isn't anything on the market, according to some farmers, other than genetically modified seed in many places. Well, there are, there's actually, a, I mean, the seed is still out there. If it's not out there, it's, it's because it's, it's, it's just taken over. Gone, from but it's not hard to obtain, apparently. Oh. I mean, half the world is still using non-GMO, non-GMO seed. I have a question. You said it's not, um, you know, it's not dangerous, but when you read this, you know, how about to human and domestic animal, caution, you know, avoid, da, 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 you know, so it doesn't seem so, to be so, so kind. <laughs> I don't know, but this is what the organic farmers use. It. They use it by the uh, tons. Usually, it's uh, it's written organic when it's used. I mean, that? some might do, but it's well, not really. Well, so yeah, I I, I I can respond to that. It, yeah. it, it, the way that organic farming 
uses BT is different than the way the GMO uses the BT. So the organic farmers are concerned about the way the GMO people use BT, but yes, indeed, it is. he's telling the truth about it. It is a popular organic insect. I mean, generally, it's sprayed on the plant. Yeah. Okay. Right? Whereas in, in the GMO plant, it's produced <coughs> in the leaves of the plant. Well, that's now, different because you can wash it in one way and the other side. But yeah. When it's GMO, you have no choice. You just eat it. Well, but but you don't eat it because it doesn't go into the seed of the plant. It goes into the so it's one of its one of the reasons why it was picked. I mean, I'm not the same. Yeah, yeah. So it's in the plant, but it's but it's not in the in the in the product that is is saved. Also, it if th this this is basically legal defense. I mean, if you read about this, one of the reasons it's chosen, one of the reasons <coughs> organic farmers like it is, it's not, it's, it has very little toxicity to humans. I mean, it won't kill adult insects. It's really not a very toxic compound unless you're an insect larva. What would happen if you drank the stuff? I'm sure that the answer is, it depends on how much you drank. <laughs> you could probably, I, I'm sure you, I'm, you know, you encounter it all the time. You just know it's out there. It's a very widespread, naturally occurring bacteria, you know, and you can't eat, you can't buy sterile vegetables. Uh, so, you know, every, that this of course is one of the things of the modern world. We know that everything is coated with microorganisms. And, and this is one of them that's out there. So that genetic modification doesn't make it into the sea. That means that the, the people who sell the uh, material have to keep selling it year after year. They have to keep buying it. You can't just have it, you know, transmitted down to future generations automatically. Well, the, well, okay. There's two things. First of all, you're probably right about what that. What did you say? I uh, you said said that it doesn't make it into the seed. The protein is not expressed in the seed because the seed, uh, it, it's a nature of the way the gene is controlled. But the, um, the DNA, the nucleus of the cells that are in the embryo in the seed, contain the whole set of DNA. So they, in fact, do have the gene. So the, so the seeds may indeed express it. Now, uh, it varies a lot from crop to crop as to whether you can grow it up again yourself. Some you can, some you can't. It just depends on exactly how it was constructed. So what the, I know there's some sort of controversy about seed companies uh, making people buy their seeds year after year and not allowing people to bought them to then sell them to other. What what is that all about? Okay, so first of all, I should say I'm a biologist, and I you know I you know I read a little bit about this, but I, I my knowledge of this is pretty limited. <laughs> uh, the basic idea is. Uh, and, and this is not just GMOs. This, for example, is true of many kinds of specialized seeds that people have been selling by all types of breeding. And that is that uh, they are able to have the seed as a kind of intellectual property such that you are not allowed to take the seed. You can use it yourself, but you cannot sell it to somebody else. Can you use That's it not here true. here? It depends. Yeah, I, well, let me, let me elaborate. You said you don't know much about the plot. I okay. could just give sort of a nutshell. Um, yeah, with, with all due respect, you're, you're giving a great talk. Um, the, what's happening is that Monsanto requires a farmer that uses their seeds to sign a contract saying that they will not use it again. In other words, they will not generate it and, and you know, but they also grow uh, Terminator seeds, which, which Cannot you know? I, I'm not sure if they're all Terminator or what, but there's this contract that, that uh, there, there was this guy that uh, had found some seed that that was in his own crop, but actually had drifted over the fence from an, from a neighbor, and he wasn't growing GMO, but there was GMO seeds showing up in his his stuff, and he planted it, and they sued him. And uh, I believe it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court support, uh, was on the side of Monsanto. And, and these lawsuits award enough money to, to completely wipe out the farm. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars that they're getting. 
and it's it's very very nefarious, and it, it makes one doubt the truth of all of the kinds of things good, you know, honest scientists are 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 trying to see and explain to the public, you know. Right now, uh, I, I might dispute part of that, okay. but I won't. But I won't get into okay. that. I won't get into that. Okay, let's move to something more controversial. <laughs> 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 all right, well, I, okay, so second second major crop is Roundup. So Roundup ready crops. So let's talk about what Roundup is. Really interesting kind of rare compound. So we know that all organisms have proteins. Proteins are made out of amino acids. There are 20 different kinds of amino acids. All right. Uh, a lot of animals, <coughs> it, more, more developed animals like ourselves, we we do not have within us the metabolic capacity to make all of those 20 amino acids. We can make about 10 of them, and the other 10 we get from our food. Plants can make all 20 of the amino acids. One of the ones that plants can make, but that we and many other animals cannot make, is tryptophan. All right, tryptophan is a rather large complex amino acid. Kind of just by kind of massive screening looking for interesting compounds, one of the biotech companies stumbled upon a chemical that blocked the synthesis of tryptophan. Now the way it did this is, and this is the way most inhibitors, the way most drugs work, is, well, here's one of my favorite questions for students. What are drugs biochemically? What do drugs do? If you take a drug, what is it doing? How does it act chemically? It changes something. <laughs> it often doesn't actually change it. You just said it's an inhibitor. Yeah, an inhibitor of? Whatever process is going to happen. Right, and these processes are usually motive done by proteins, enzymes. Almost all drugs are inhibitors of enzymes. They stick to an enzyme, they bind tightly to it, and they stop the enzyme from working. Roundup, a drug called glyphosate, is an inhibitor of the enzyme that makes tryptophan. So if you get glyphosate in the system, it binds to this. You can't make that one amino acid. It's essential for proteins, and it will kill the organism. Now, if you do not make tryptophan, you do not have the binding target for the drug. So the drug has no effect on organisms that don't have the pathway to make tryptophan. Now, it just, it, for, and I don't, un, I haven't really read into the underlying biology of this, but it, it, it's a very small compound. The, the pharmaceutical companies, the biotech companies, are always looking for things that are relatively small so that, and uncomplicated, and this turns out to be a relatively small, uncomplicated molecule that, if just sprayed on the plant, will go into the cells of the plant, spread through the whole system, inhibit tryptophan synthesis, and kill the plant. So it's a broad-spectrum herbicide. It kills plants, but it's very specific for plants. It's also because it's a relatively small, simple molecule. It's quickly degraded in the soil. Soil bacteria can attack it and degrade it. So it's an enzyme that activates this plant enzyme. So they've made GMO plants in which they modified this tryptophan synthesizing enzyme. They make a slight change in the shape of the enzyme such that it still functions, it still makes tryptophan, but it won't bind Roundup. All right, and so what you can do in this case is they took the plant's enzyme to make tryptophan. Then they, they actually took the gene, they changed part of the DNA sequence to make a slightly different shape in this enzyme. Then they put that enzyme, that DNA, into the plant by that same type of method that I showed you earlier. And now you have a corn plant, let's say, 
that has this modified tryptophan enzyme and if you spray a cornfield with Roundup, almost every kind of plant there will die except for the corn plant because it's got the modified enzyme. So this has been maybe the single most successful GMO crop of them all uh, because the reason the farmers love it is uh, because they don't have to cultivate the field or they don't have to use other herbicides because how do you control weeds in a field well typically you control it by you go through the field either with a mechanical uh, cultivator or with a crew of people uh, but in some ways you just got to use labor to get rid of the weeds now kind of an early spring of this roundup kill the weeds. So that's why that has kind of taken over so much of, of uh, agriculture, especially for sort of corn, corn, corn primarily, but I think soybeans also. All right, so uh, that's, that's kind of our second big story. Now let me move to the third kind of thing that GMOs are used for, are plant diseases. And um, kind of long term, I think people think that, I mean, in the, in the kind of agricultural schools, this is the one where they're concerned that they might not have any other way of dealing with globalization. So the problem is <coughs> that diseases that used to be localized to certain countries or continents are now spreading all around the world. And there are lots of examples of this. But here let me give you uh, the example of the papaya industry in Hawaii. So Hawaii is a kind of tropical, subtropical region. Uh, they grew papayas there for decades and then the papaya started dying because they contracted this disease. It's caused by a virus and one of the early symptoms is you get these lesions on the skin of the virus, disfigures the fruit, but more seriously the virus injects its DNA not only into the fruit but into the whole plant and it basically kills the plant. So <coughs> it really very much wiped out the papaya industry in Hawaii. Now in this case though, they were plants, you know, have an immune system of their own. Now the underlying biology is completely different. You know, they, they don't have antigens and antibodies and all of that. But they have a way of recognizing invading viruses. After all, viruses have been invading plants for hundreds of millions of years and a natural defense mechanism has come about. And so with the GMO plants, what happens is they, they can essentially give something that is kind of like a vaccine to ring spot virus to the plant and they, they become resistant to the disease. And so this was put into use in Hawaii um, maybe as much as 20 years ago now probably at least 20 years ago now. And, and the Hawaiian papaya industry has come back. They sell them as something called rainbow papayas or something, but they're, they're basically it's the kind of only way you can, you can grow that. Now there, there are lots of, of, of examples around the world where, where similar problems are occurring. One of the interesting ones right now, you may have heard of is bananas. You know, or the standard banana, the standard grocery store banana is called the Cavendish banana. And it's, uh, it's now grown around the world, but uh, the um, kind of African-Asian plantings have been hit by this fungus disease for almost 20 years now. And they're treating it with some really nasty stuff. The places in South America had been resistant, but now it's starting to appear in South American plantations. And so, I mean, there are multiple ways of going about this. One way is to grow another variety of banana, and they're, they're working on that. There are dozens of varieties of banana. But something like that, conceivably, just as you could 
treat other diseases with a vaccine, it may be possible to vaccinate against this fungal disease that's hitting bananas. So uh, this pathogen resistance is a, is a big target of GMO plants. All right, so let me move on to the last one, last example here. Okay, so this is the, the golden rice story. Now, almost all of the examples I've given you so far have been developed primarily by uh, agricultural companies like Monsanto, et cetera. This was, this was not. This came out of the university, came out of Europe initially. Uh, and it was dealing with the problem that I mentioned early that 80% of kind of all the calories in the world are from like three major crops. Well, of course, for a big part of the world, that major crop is rice. And it's generally white rice. It's white rice because white rice can be kept for long periods of time. You've gotten rid of the embryo, the parts that will become infected or become uh, uh, get oxidation damage, basically. So milled white rice is <laughs> something that in many parts of the world people eat three times a day. Now, if, if you have access to a balanced diet, you supplement this with vegetables or beans or meat or something. And that's where the vitamins come from. But there are many people who get very little of that supplement and they eat mostly white rice. So, it's for, for decades, that there is something in the order of 550,000 children every year who die of vitamin A deficiency in these parts of the world where they're living primarily on white rice. And there are probably another 650 million every year uh, that go blind. Vitamin A it forms part of the pigment in the back of your eye. And so if you don't, and uh, What's a vitamin? You know an answer to what's a vitamin? It's an enzyme that your body can't make on its own. So not an enzyme, but, but it is a chemical that your body cannot make it on its own. So it's some small, complex organic molecule that we have to get in our diet because we don't have the capability of making them. Uh, plants and bacteria can make all the vitamins. I mean, plants can make everything, basically sunshine, air, and a few minerals. But we have to get them in our diet. And rice makes vitamin A, but it's out in the green leafy part. And if you eat a lot of brown rice, there's the vitamin A in the embryo part. But the re refined grain has virtually none. And that's why these people get the, the blindness. So these university people started out saying, well, the, the rice can make vitamin A. It has to have vitamin A for its own function. It just doesn't put it into the cells that make the, the, the rice grain. So they've been working on this for many years, for decades. And vitamin A, as I said, is a colored pigment. Okay, so it's actually a yellow in color. So they took the genes uh, that were needed, and in this case, it, it wasn't as though the cells that make the rice grains don't have it, but they don't turn the gene on when they're making the rice grain. So every gene has in front of it a control element, part of the ACs, T's and G's, uh, give the sequence to say this gene should be turned on or off under certain conditions and in certain cell types. Turn this one on in the flower, but not in the root, etc. So the early forms of this um, showed that it worked in principle, but in fact it didn't have enough uh, vitamin A to really be effective. Uh, and in interestingly, because uh, it was mostly universities running out of this, it was done at a very low budget. It's, it's moved very slowly. But uh, in the last five years, they've now upped the vitamin A that's in it by 20x. And uh, it's gone through this FDA approval process, and it's 
been approved in Australia, New Zealand, um, I don't know, there's one other country in that part of the world, and, and in the US. So it's still in a developmental stage. It's not, it's not out there. But they probably have a, a form now. You can see there are all sorts of other complications. It has to taste good. It has to be acceptable to people who've been living on rice in their diet. And so uh, it's nearing the stage where it's likely to be start growing in, in large quantities. Question? Yes? Does that girl have cataracts or just, just reflection of light on her cornea? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's really, her, it's, 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 it's as though her pupils are, I, I don't know the answer to your question. I don't know what the symptoms of that kind of blindness are. Yeah. All right, so I'm sort of getting uh, close to the end here. One thing I want to uh, mention as we wrap up here is that the technology, as I said, is really being replaced now by this CRISPR system. Uh, so CRISPR was kind of discovered and <coughs> developed by a woman, Jennifer Dudna, who's a professor up at UC Berkeley, and she worked with a, uh, a colleague uh, in Europe. And uh, what they were, this is a perfect example of, uh, of studying kind of weird esoteric systems for which there can obviously be no benefit until you find something really interesting. She was studying how bacteria become resistant to viruses. I mean, how, how do, what is the immune system in a bacteria? Well, it turns out that the way bacteria can become resistant to viruses is that if they get infected with a virus, the virus injects their DNA into the bacterium. And the bacteria will often have ways of recognizing that that is not their DNA, and they'll cut it into pieces. But what evolved was that they saved some of the pieces and incorporated it into their own uh, into their own DNA. And so, if they got attacked by this same type of virus again. You know, if DNA has the same sequence, they will come up and line up and they will bind to each other. And if the bacteria's own DNA got bound to a piece of viral DNA, that triggered a signal saying, we are being attacked. <laughs> We've just been injected with viral DNA. And it makes an enzyme that will go and chop up every, any DNA that has those those virus fragments. So the beauty of it is that it's, it's highly specific for a target. So in the lab, what you can do if you want to modify some piece of DNA, you can just insert this little piece of, you can, the way you make a piece of DNA nowadays, you can do this at home. You go to your computer, there's a company, there's lots of companies, and you type in the sequence that you want, as far as knowing what sequence what you want, you can look it up on the UCSE genome browser and get the sequence of all the DNA of all the organisms that are, exist in the world. You have to know what to look for, but it's all there. All right. And anyway, you can order it, and it'll be on your desk next morning. And if it's a piece big enough to do this kind of sequencing, we'll set you back about $4.50. All right. Plus shipping. All right. So, Anyway, and I'm, of course, glossing over something here, but the point is, if, if you know the gene that you want to modify, it's possible to, to simply order the ingredients here, put them into the right cells, and they will make these changes in the DNA. So this is being used to, to change all sorts of things. So, I mean, for example, one of the first possible human applications people have thought about, and it's, I know it's, it's, it's uh, pretty well advanced, is uh, sickle cell anemia. You know, sickle cell anemia is a really nasty disease that kills tens of thousands of people, and there are millions of people who suffer from it, and it's due to 
the change in a single letter in the DNA that makes hemoglobin. All right. And so if you had a way of, of saying, in a person who has sickle cell anemia, of just extracting some of the stem cells from their bone marrow that make their blood, and you could do CRISPR on it, such as you could change this A to a T, and put those cells back in the person, they could make normal hemoglobin. And people are, people are doing that right now. Uh, in, in, that, in that case, in, in, uh, I mean, I'm kind of drifting off a, a little bit here, that the worries are you want to make sure that you didn't make any other changes. So that's the one thing they're working so they're on. they're doing this with adults? Yes. Oh. But if you do it with adults and you're doing it with stem cells, these genes will not be passed on to your progeny <coughs> because they're not affecting your sperm and your egg. Where, where this gets really uh, to be a, a problem we have to really regulate is when you start affecting sperm cells and egg cells because those changes once made can be passed on to, on to your children. So, so somebody who has sickle cell anemia goes through this, is cured basically, their children can still... The children will still, can still get it, yes, right. Unless they're wealthy parents, in which case they can pay the right guy to make sure their kids don't get it either. They might be out there. <laughs> they may indeed. Okay. All right. So just a, a, a little bit of uh, kind of addressing some of the issues. So is it safe to eat DNA or BT toxin? Another trick question. Would you eat the DNA of other animals? You do, we do it all the time. Absolutely, of yeah. course. You know, about five percent of your <coughs> your diet is DNA. Uh, and if you look on the back of a of a, any any food package and it tells you what the, how much carbohydrate, fat, and protein is, where's the DNA? Protein. It's in all of it. All of it. Yeah. No. They. I mean, it, it, so it's arbitrary. They put they put it in with the carbohydrate. Uh, and it's because uh, DNA has a sugar backbone. So, so in fact, if you chop up DNA, you liberate some sugar, but most of, most of what you liberate are the nucleotides, which are not sugar, fat, or, or protein. They're, they're a different kind of molecule. All right, so, so the answer to this is, well, of course, yes, that's not really the issue because you eat a lot of DNA and you eat a lot of toxins all the time. <coughs> Roundup, of course, there's all sorts of issues around Roundup. One, one thing I, I just want to mention here is, is um, a new important use of Roundup is directly connected to global warming. And that is that one of the major sources of greenhouse gases is agriculture. And especially whenever you plow the field. So good soil is soil that has a lot of organic material, in it, a lot of dead plant material, cellulose, all of those corn cobs, leaves, etc., digested material that hold water. They have, they have <coughs> other nutrients in them. And whenever you till the soil, you take something that is not exposed to the air, and now it's exposed to the air. And the microbes in the soil take the oxygen from the air and the CO2 from the organic material and they make CO and the carbon and they make CO2 and they release it. And it's substantial. Um, some estimates is on the order 20, 25% of all CO2 emission may come from uh, simply cultivating the soil in agriculture. How do you get around it? Well, Big new thing, uh, not not that not that new, but within the last ten years, it's starting to really be done is what's called no-till agriculture. What if you don't cultivate? You just take the old crop, you know, just you cut off your wheat, you got your stubs <coughs> left on there, and you just have a you just punch your seed into the ground without tilling it. All right, then it'll come up again, and uh, there's been lots of 
tests and trials done on this, and it's a, it's it's a very good way to do agriculture because you're you're keeping everything that's in the soil in there. The main problem is that all the weeds will come up. I mean, why did you cultivate it in the first place? I mean, more largely to prevent the weeds from coming up. So what the, the no-till farmers are doing is they grow the crop and then they, they go and, and typically they have machines to kind of ground it up to ideally you leave a kind of layer of dead plants in the top. Then they have these special seed, seeding machines now <coughs> developed for no-till <coughs> agriculture. And then sometimes very early in the process, they will spray the whole thing with Roundup. And in fact, in this case, it doesn't even necessarily have to be a GMO crop, as long as the seed hasn't germinated yet. Spray with a round, Roundup, that'll kill all the weeds, your crop comes up, and you never did the cultivation. So, um, so this is, uh, it doesn't have to be Roundup, there are all sorts of herbicides out there reason they, they tend to use Roundup is because it's less toxic than, than the other ones that are in the market. All right, um, does Roundup or BT toxin kill butterflies or honeybees? Well, <coughs> so the, the two, two main things <coughs> are uh, that these are fairly specific for the larval stage of the insect. The other thing is the timing. Generally, these are applied very early in the season before these other things come up. But there, there's no denying there's all sorts of problems going on with honeybees. And uh, from what I read, uh, what's causing it, it turns out to be multiple, multiple problems. And it's still not really well understood. All right, so uh, lastly here, so the GMO debate is uh, the opposition to GMO, I think that Part of the core of this is that GMO crops are produced by an unnatural process, and therefore it's inherently risky. Do we know what's happening if we're tinkering with the genome, moving genes from one organism to another? The pro-GMO side says GMO crops are produced by essentially the same processes that occur in nature, and that extensive testing has shown no adverse effects. Well, I don't uh, agree with either of those statements. But. <laughs> so, I, I, for me, the, I think probably one of the most important things is going back to that original that slide I showed you of where they're used around the world. And that is that we have, we've done, for one reason or another, this grand experiment where we've taken one whole continent and we fed the people with GMO crops, and we've taken another whole continent, and there are no GMO crops. And so a lot of people have done this epidemiology. We know how much of these things have been used over time. We know the incidence of all sorts of cancer rates, et cetera, and all sorts of diseases. Is there any correlation with that? And the answer is no. There's not. I mean, if you take something like cancer rates generally, for example, in the U.S., total cancer rates have gone down by 25% in the last 20 years. Now, now that's the biggest factor of all, smoking. All right. Cancer rates in Britain have gone up. It's a, you know, I would not use that as a convincing argument for the, and I, therefore, there's no problem. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying looking at this grand experiment done with millions of people, nothing really has popped out in us that there's a correlation between that. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, it is so young. I mean, there's not even a generation. So we well, don't know two, three, four, ten generations what they would do. You know, we see that more allergy, for example. We don't know exactly why, but a well, lot of people uh, are allergic. What was that part? A lot allergies. of people are allergic. Oh, al allergies. You know, allergies. Like, I'm from Europe, you can mm -hmm. hear it. You know, in, when I go back to France, I don't know anybody allergic except maybe for hay fever. So, uh, yeah, uh, but you know, it's it's kind of the exception. Here, and I'm a therapist, so mm -hmm. it's almost everybody. Everybody almost has one allergy or something. So I don't know if there is a connection, but it's a question. 
And also when you talk about the soil, yes, but when you kill all those uh, weeds, we call them weeds because they are in the wrong place, but they are yeah. not bad you know, plants. That well, that's the, the definition place. of a weed, right? So a lot of um, different insects and so on need those too. You know, so there's a whole balance in the ecosystem which I think is kind of disturbed, you know? But, but the, the question here is, I mean, one way or the other, they get rid of the weeds. It's just a question of whether they plow them under or whether you... Well, you compost them. I mean, for hundreds of years, thousands of years, people. So it's more work, it's more, you know. And so more and more people are going back to those, I mean, not to the past, you know, in a scientific mm -hmm. way, but uh, avoiding to have, you know, kind of industrialized, you know, food production, which, you know, anyway. Yeah, you and just to piggyback on what yeah, she was yeah. saying, we do actually have some epidemics right now that are happening, and there are, it's auto, a lot of autoimmune diseases are coming up. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, what I've heard is that the way that Roundup and glyphosate work is that it affects the intestinal tract of these whatever is consuming it. So if if that's the case, and then we're eating the plants, then isn't it possible that it's affecting us as well in the same way, right? I mean, and, but, but the thing is, is yeah. I mean, I, I, my big thing is that I, I feel like I completely disagree with so many of the stuff that you have up here mm -hmm. on GMOs being safe and how it just becomes inert in the soil after, after you know, it seems like you have up there a very short period of time. I didn't see where your research came from on that in your slide on glyphosate where you said it becomes right. inert. So I, I have at the end here references references to many papers. These are these are reviews, and I, this this one and and uh, some more recent ones on CRISPR, etc. But this, of course, this question has been intensively looked at, and it's not just a U.S. thing. So, and, and of course, in Europe, of course, they're having the same argument between the scientists and the non-scientists. Excuse but me. Because the, the, the European science councils oh, want these to be approved. So, for example, the most recent one a couple of years ago, the ones that were very reluctant, were in New Zealand. So the New Zealand put the National Academy of New Zealand to study Roundup specifically. And they concluded at the end that there was no evidence that Roundup was a danger. I've read it. Now, I mean, I've read a lot of these papers. The intestinal thing, that BT toxin affects the intestine, but glyphosate is a is a you know inhibitor of that tryptophan enzyme. Uh, I mean, um, the other anyway. May, may these I, these I, are these are kind you. of they have the references. For and against that people have looked at, and then I, I there's uh, just a couple of other. Th this New York Times article I think is is a good combination of giving you the two sides of the argument. Uh, this one is uh, on the the recent uh, uh, stories that have been come coming up about Roundup. Uh, so there there's lots of things out there, and it's. And it has been intensively investigated. Yeah, um, on the, there, there's a lot of concern about Roundup, and it isn't scientists versus non-scientists. There are a lot of scientists who also are concerned about Roundup. But one of the concerns, setting aside whether or not it's bad for your health, mm -hmm. is that the, uh, a lot of crops have developed Roundup-ready resistance and so they're now turning to other, uh, more toxic mm -hmm. uh, uh, pesticides. And uh, the GMO companies and so forth are trying to develop plants that are resistant to these <coughs> more toxic things. And the result is basically that the crops themselves are being sprayed with either Roundup or now something something worse. So that, that's an, another issue. Um, and another issue as well is that there's been a political repression of scientists 
who are speaking out against GMOs. Uh, our pod push tea was, was one that was early on, it was well publicized, you can look up his name on the internet. Um, and his, his, his uh, original statement was he was one of the scientists that, he, he was assigned to research whether or not it was bad for your health. He found concerns about, in the rats that he was studying, even before he got to the humans, and they published it anyway, and they, they discredited him, and they shamed him. And then a couple of years later, I mean, the Royal Academy uh, shamed him, I believe. I mean, it was a big, big deal. But then, I don't remember if they shamed him or, or got him back. But anyway, there, there was this, it's a political fight, okay? Also, uh, on the staff of, of uh, colleges, I hope you're not filming me in my voice. <laughs> no, <Thank you. laughs> no, I'm, uh, we're looking at him. My voice. We're looking uh, at him. Thank you. Um, <laughs> on the staff of colleges, if you have concerns about GMOs, you're you're almost never hired. I hear to be on, uh, you know, to to be in charge of that aspect of the the science department, and you know, so so there's this whole collusion going on, and then there's these lawsuits against the, the farmers that's putting them out of business. I mean, there's this giant, powerful uh, entities going out there, and that's the real reason why the public is so concerned about uh, whether or not GMO, I mean, it's hard to identify is this bad for your health, but, but most GMO crops have been developed to resist uh, Pesticides. That's a very good question. The, the, uh, I'm sorry? Thanks, brother. What was the question? Uh, okay. I'm sorry, I, I, I just want to complete my thought. Right. Uh, the golden rice thing, they're, they're working on it, that works more power to them. The CRISPR thing, I'm hoping that it has less problems. There, there are well, potentially good. in 20 minutes. If you uh, need a library card, for it. please go to the service so, desk now. You know, it's, it's not like the, the public, you hear this low. over and over again, the public is not science, they don't understand no, GMO, and this is why it's, it's unnatural, this is not true, and I, I wish you wouldn't repeat it. Okay, so, I'm going to suggest we wait till this announcement is over before we continue. You know, until recently, I didn't pay much attention. Organic equal uh, non-GMO yeah. uh, versus uh, GMO vegetables and fruits. But now I do. I pay a little bit more money, and I do uh, see it, find it different in taste. That the uh, blackberries taste much better. The, the strawberries taste much better when you buy organic. So. There must be something which is watering down, for lack of other words, uh, or maybe not having enough vitamins, perhaps, in GMO fruits. Can you comment there a little bit? Not really. <laughs> huh? okay. so I have a question. Why is it that in the United States they refuse, you know, again and again to have GMOs written on a package, for example? So people who buy in their own freedom to decide they want they're okay to buy GMOs or not. It's it's not every time there is a people can vote for that, it's also great. It's already on well, well well so for the there uh, it's just it's not there was a prop there was proposition thirty seven so, so that means that they were gonna label currently if you go and that that buy stuff yeah. a great deal of what I buy says non GMO it's it's a non yeah, to be written when yeah. it is GMO, yeah. yeah. So right. you, you know, it's uh, non-GMO, but when it is. Yeah. Uh, I'm, why not? Well, I mean, it's, it's outside of my area. I, I, I would, but a big piece of it, it, it's the same reason why, why they don't identify um, all these crops that are coming from mutations that were induced by toxic chemicals. In other words, so so here, here's the argument, and that is that they're saying the labeling should reflect what's in the plant, 
not the way the plant was grown. And that's, that's kind of the core of it. And they say, if you look in the plant, the nutritional content or whatever this, if, if you can identify something that's in there that's, that's <coughs> different, that would be a basis of labeling. But if you can't, then it shouldn't be labeled. That's the argument. So on a totally different subject, I was surprised to see that Russia has no GMO. I mean, that does not seem like a country that would have banned GMOs. Is that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I noticed that too. Okay. Yeah. I, I, but uh, I mean, a lot of it too is, of course, uh, where you export to. So, if, so if you're exporting uh, to uh, Europe, sure. yeah. Yeah. then yeah. you're yeah. often don't grow GMOs. So I am wondering about all of the crops that were modified through chemicals. Yeah. So that has been going on since the 20s. I mean, is there a lot of that still out there? And has all that, so that's still going on and that's all just been handed and it kind of gets absorbed into the, the, the well, DNA remember, of the plant the over time? The chemicals were used to make a change in the sequence of the letters of DNA. It, and that made something resistant to some virus or made the seed bigger or something. And so that changed gene, which is, is the gene itself is identical to one that may have occurred through some natural mutation. After all, I mean, uh, what, what's the difference if, if we use uh, nuclear radiation to change a gene versus the gamma rays that are hitting us right now at a very high frequency that then, and that are causing all sorts of mutations in us. One is considered natural and one is not, but the DNA is exactly the same. The A goes to a G or whatever. Mm. So all of those, those uh, types of genetic modifications were just using that to make the original <coughs> gene, but then once the crop is grown, it's just, it's just DNA with a different sequence. They'll, they'll be different, se you're saying the sequences would be different depending on what hits it, right? Depending on what well, well, I'm saying that there are many different ways that you can cause a sequence in the DNA. I mean, we have, every time we change our cell, we, we make 10,000 mistakes. Mm -hmm. We correct most of them. All right, and but I would just love that, it's so funny that we have the title GMO and then you listed all those four different ways that could be classified as GMO and they're, they seem so different in their approach and, it, and science is so often so specific about things. It would be really lovely if there was a different terminology for each one of those four things because it, it's so confusing because some of them I'm, I'm okay with and others I'm not. Right, right, yeah, the termina, and, and then of course if you look in the, you know, the way they actually use it legally, they do do it, they, they do define those, but in common use, they right. don't. How close are they to the golden rice success? Well, well, um, so it's a combination between a group in Switzerland and a group, I think, in, in Pakistan, which is one of the countries where this is a problem, that they've, they've got something now that seems to give you enough vitamin A to, to really overcome the de most of the deficiency. From what I've read, it's still a not as though you can just eat this and be okay. You still need some source of, of uh, vegetables and other material, but it's, it's a big step. Could you like one day put a multivitamin in rice? <laughs> <laughs> well, so that, that would have the same value of, of, as, of uh, I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> People have said with some justification that multivitamins allow you to produce very expensive urine. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it. Yeah. Right. Okay, well thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.